I'm really excited for our next session here, simplifying the user experience uh, with uh, virtual machines and self-service. Um, I'm going to present our phenomenal presenter here in just a moment, but before I do that, I just want to let everyone know, um, this topic has a ton of stuff going on, and, and we do expect a lot of questions. We're going to run a Q&A session at the end of this. Um, myself and my colleague, Chu, who's hanging out in the back, got his hand in the air, are going to be running around with microphones. i just like to ask, please don't yell out questions. We're only going to respond to questions asked through the mics, but you and I are going to make sure that we get these mics in as many hands as possible, and then, of course, like everything else, we can take things offline as necessary. So without further ado from Kinetics, I'd like to introduce to you Gaurav. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me in the back there? Show of hands, yeah? Cool, great. So what we're going to, well, first off, this was originally supposed to be an interactive session, right, where you can actually go ahead and work in self-service, uh, get into an Azure or AWS environment. Unfortunately, the amount of accounts needed and uh, the fact that we're all IT persons here, a little worried about security as well, because we all like to you know, get those passwords sometimes. And, uh, so we are going to have a great presentation, that being said, and we're going to show a really nice demo as well of how everything works together and how everything works through self-service. Cool. <coughs> So my name is Grava Grawal, and I am with Connex Technology Services. It, Connex is a San Mateo and New York-based managed service provider uh, that serves clients uh, with offices all around the world, and our core businesses are within the U.S. Um, at Connex, I am involved heavily in specialized requirements uh, for our clients ranging from security and infrastructure to evaluate new platforms and, augment, uh, and provide augmented, improved workflows. Right? And that being said, the biggest uh, challenge that we've had is with virtual machines and getting them up and running for our user bases, whether it be RDS environments, virtual desktops, or uh, even U uh, Ubuntu Linux instances. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, deploying virtual machines with Jamf, particularly managing virtual machines through self-service. We're going to see why we've had a need to deploy virtual machines for various customers and how we mitigate some of the security concerns around virtual machines. Uh, we're going to first discuss how we used to deliver VMs, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you are probably still delivering VMs this way through Jamf, uh, through policies and pushing out those large uh, VMDK templates uh, from a very high level. And then we're going to take a look at the workflow that was involved with that and how we can correct that workflow by using cloud-hosted environments, either in our own data centers, um, in Azure, AWS, or uh, even Google, Google's cloud platform. Um, and then finally, we'll have a nice little demo about how this looks on the end user side, and hopefully leaving enough time for Q&A. Weird animations there. <laughs> so uh, why do we need virtual machines? Uh, well, that's somewhat of an, e of an easy answer. We all have been in that position where a user has this odd plugin or application that has to work in a particular environment. Uh, it has to work on a particular OS, and God forbid, uh, you know, someone updates something, all of a sudden it doesn't work. Or the, the software vendor or application vendor or plugin vendor hasn't caught up to uh, actually supporting the latest build of the software or the latest OS. Furthermore, certain applications demand a very high density of resources due to embedded macros, analytics, or even graphics processing. Uh, if many of you have used SolidWorks, huge amount of uh, processing power right there, right? And dedicated graphics processing units. Um, and we can't very well give everybody the, the latest generation of MacBook Pros with i7s, quad cores, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, if, if they're in someone such as in finance, or anything like that, and we can't really justify that expense as we scale up as well. We also need to maintain a certain level of security uh, and intellectual property control. Uh, a great example of this is banking institutions uh, love to use virtual desktops because everything is cloud hosted, they can control the, the flow of data in and out, and the ability to terminate sessions is almost instantaneous. Uh, we also need to have the ability to scale and provide rapid deployments for our users because sometimes you need a VM uh, available to your user the next day, but they may be in London, they may be in Paris, uh, they may be anywhere in the world, you really don't have any idea about that because 
uh, the workforce nowadays is going towards more and more uh, remote capabilities. So what was our previous workflow uh, and, uh, in delivering these VMs in JAM? Well, we'd have to first provide a hypervisor, VMware Fusion or uh, Parallels, whatever hypervisor that you'd prefer, and we'd have to provide the licensing key installed in there so we can try to you know, make sure users have everything that they could possibly need to get it up and running. And unfortunately, not all hypervisors. I believe Parallels is available as a VPP app, the Parallels client, but you can't get VMware Fusion through VPP yet. So you'd have to control those license keys. Um, and on top of which, you have to put additional restrictions for version controls, uh, because uh, if they accidentally upgrade it, they may possibly break um, networking configurations or even uh, have to deal with some extension, uh, external extensions that we've come across now with the latest builds of Mac OS, right? And then you have to create your templates. You've got to create that VM template that you've got to push out to your users, which ranges anywhere from a gig if it's Ubuntu Linux all the way up to 10 gigs, depending on what you're putting inside that template, right? And that template, we could certainly put in the cloud, right? Or, obviously the preferred way is putting it into our local uh, file share systems. That being said, not everyone is in the office all the time, right? And not everyone has a VPN connection. And even then, your bottlenecks are always the endpoints, your users. You may have a one gig connection at your office, but your users don't have a one gig uh, up and down connection at their home offices, or if they're remote at a client site, for example, right? And then we're gonna wrap everything up together Create those policies, create those smart groups instead of Java Pro, right? And we're going to go ahead and push this out to our users. And then the phone calls start, right? They're going to start calling, hey, the network's not right, hey, I can't get in, hey, Excel is working really, really slow, and you ask, where are you using Excel? Oh, it's in my VM, right? I need a new 16 gig Mac Pro so I can support Excel on my VM. And those are the questions you're going to get. Those are the service, ticket, service tickets that are going to keep coming in nonstop from your users, right? So you're always picking up the phone, you're always uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, you gotta get that finance uh, report in and they're like, Excel is crashing because it's out of memory, right? And that's just one particular example. What's wrong with all those old ways? Well, aside from licensing controls, right? You've gotta make sure that you have the right amount of licenses, uh, you're embedding those licenses, you are not out of compliance with licenses, getting those VLK keys can sometimes be tricky. Uh, security controls, you're not able to actually maintain any security on your VMs after you've actually deployed them out because what's gonna happen? You've got software updates, the VMs are not always online, they can always disconnect the NIC, right? So you now have to put in another EMM solution, can, uh, install another Jamf agent as well, uh, and get the Jamf binary on those uh, VMs, right? Uh, possibly use Intune if it's Windows. What are you gonna do with Linux and uh, with Ubuntu environments, right? How are you gonna maintain the continuous security that's needed? Because you, if, as long as they're online and you can access them, fantastic. If they're offline, can't do anything, right? And what about if you have to actually push out a new template? You have to have upgrades needed. You have to put in the latest version of an application finally, right? And try to get your users to use that. You then have to recreate a lot of your templates, re-push them out, and then cycle through the endless users saying, hey, I'm not getting this to work. Oh, you're using the wrong one already, right? So your lack of control is no longer there as well. On top of which, you can't really scale it, right? You can't, I, I, pushing out 10 gig files, three gig files, Though it seems really easy, we've got that you know, CDN network and AWS and stuff, but getting it actually working and making sure you have the bandwidth and the resources to handle that, it's, it's quite difficult. So scalability is a huge factor. So how can we achieve this with cloud services, right? So we can jet leverage Jamf plus cloud services to deliver, to deliver a seamlessly integrated Virtual machine self-service, very long sentence, in simplistic form, it's basically using Jamf's self-service as a gateway to Azure, to AWS, to Google Compute, or even our own data center, right? We can go ahead and create the workflows that users are used to in self-service with simple smart groups, simple policies, right? Where we're only executing a command at the root level and getting those users 
into the right environments that they need to, while maintaining the security and control that we really need, and having the feasibility to scale up as we need and scale down as, as, we, as users leave the company or whatever may be the case. Right? So we can use our data centers, AWS, and Azure to actually deliver that RDS framework right? and create the users on demand as needed, or even deliver persistent and non-persistent virtual desktops right? Th and while still using the gateway as an entry point from self-service. That being said, we can also go ahead and deliver Ubuntu Linux right? and Mac OS straight through self-service using uh, really awesome HTML5 and uh, really awesome web browser-based tools that many of you don't actually realize that you can actually have embedded web, you can actually have an embedded web browser in self-service and just leverage that inside. And we're actually gonna see how that actually looks and works, right? So how does Kinetics actually manage these virtual environments? Right? We have this really cool uh, uh, visual diagram that I did, which kind of shows you just roughly a lot of the stuff that we're doing here. So we have our end user self-service portal, right? And by the way, everything that we're doing is secure traffic, SSL, and everything is connected to a IDP identity provider, right? In our case, we're using one login as our identity provider, which is connected through Active Directory, so we're able to control usernames, control passwords uniformly across all of our instances. In the demo that you guys are gonna see here, I purposely left out uh, one login as a central point for everything, just to demonstrate it's totally up to you what you can use, right? You can use uh, Open LDAP, you can use anything that you want to. You can even use Google's now supported uh, uh, IDP to deliver anything that you want to to centralize not just self-service, but your entire environment, right? So the user would go to self-service, they would go ahead and click on what environment that they wanted to access, whether it's their virtual desktop on Mac OS or their virtual desktop in Windows, right? or their RDS network to access uh, files off the company file share if they wanted to. It, all of them located in the cloud, right? It would send out the connection to the internet, either AWS, uh, Google Cloud, or Azure, or to our data center, which then the firewall comes in and says, hey, where are you going? Did you authenticate properly? Sending it down to our Active Directory server and uh, our um, RDA gateway and then our session host, redirecting the users to either the RDS farm or our Windows 10 Enterprise Persistent Virtual Desktops. And uh, show of hands, how many persons are aware of what persistent and non-persistent desktops are? Cool. For the rest of you guys, so persistent desktops, basically whenever a user logs in, they're able to be directed directly into their virtual desktop infrastructure, their virtual desktops. Non-persistent desktops, you're actually creating a new desktop environment for your users in Windows 10 on demand as they're logging in. So in the one to two minutes, as they're logging in, authenticating their credentials, a new desktop environment is spun up from a golden template that we have in the hypervisor that actually brings up the user and shows their desktop, their pictures, their frames. And when they shut down, it wipes and deletes that image for them after a certain period of time or whatever they prefer, right? And when they log back in, they get a new clean environment. Now imagine that as not just the ultimate sandbox environment for your users, but imagine that as a way of getting the most amount of security as well. Because it doesn't matter what they install on there at that point. They can do whatever they want. They can run a muck. When it powers down, everything's wiped. So how, what about the workflow? Let's take a look at the workflow. One of the key things that I wanted to point out is that we go out of our way to make sure we have the most amount of security in our infrastructure. Right? Most amount of security at the user level, most amount of security on the server level. Whenever a user goes ahead, goes ahead and clicks on the environment that they prefer, the actual RDP file, the encrypted RDP file, right, or the PEM certificate needed for Ubuntu Linux is downloaded on demand to the user, stored in a private system level root directory that they have no access to, right? And when they actually finish the session, or after a couple of seconds, a launch daemon or a script kicks into action, wipes those files from their, from their computers. So not only can't they search for the file, they can't even get back in unless they go back into self-service, clicks on the button, and 
re-access it again the same way. Right? They're going to re-access that file, and it's going to be as if the file never ever left their computer. Right? And we can obviously, if you wanted to, have this as a cache policy or not, obviously not, because you're accessing a cloud infrastructure. If you have no internet, you're not supposed to get in anyway, right guys? And we're able to actually do all of this through smart groups without using packages, because what we're doing is we're curling down the files from our cloud-based file server system, Ignite, and we're pushing it down there on demand. So all we have to do is modify our policies with the latest RDP, the latest PEM certificate without creating a package, without, uh, without creating a, a DMG package or a PKG. We can just on demand change those parameters as we need to, or use the API to update as well, or if we need to across multiple Jam Pro servers. With Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud has this ability where you can actually have a web browser-based SSH session. So you can actually access Ubuntu or a Linux environment inside of a web browser. And because self-service, again, has web browser built in, you can actually embed it in there. So your users don't have to go in there, right? And on top of which, we can even launch Terminal to get to the next level for that. So what can we do with our hosted VMs? We can deploy Linux, Mac OS, Windows machines, end user desktops, older operating systems to support those legacy applications, provide those sandboxes that we want to use, or anything that our user comes in and we're not sure if they should actually have, we'll throw it into that environment for them. Here you go, go ahead and access it through self-service. Spend a minute creating that smart group, spend a minute creating that policy, and they have instant access in about five to 15 minutes, depending on how you prefer your check-ins to be done or however self-service is going to work for you guys. Uh, one of the biggest things we've been able to do that we haven't been able to successfully do previously was back up all of our virtual environments because, as you know, if you have those VMs sitting at the user level doing blockchain <laughs> backups, uh, Time Machine or anything like that has always cumbersome for those really large VMs because they're not always on the network, right? They're always not going to be backing up no matter if you push out backblaze or anything else. It's going to be a little tricky, right? Especially doing those incrementals and getting those additional files. Well, now because everything is cloud hosted, we have backups after backups after backups using Backblaze, Veeam, um, and a bunch of other things built in AWS like EBS snapshots. And just getting those backups done so we can go back whenever we need to, if we had to, in any of our environments. Security. Everybody loves security here, right? Because we have to make sure we provide the most secure method that doesn't harm the workflow because a security method that is cumbersome of the workflow will not really be accepted well. Well, what we're doing is we can remove access for our users in a matter of seconds. We can scope them out of a policy. We can deactivate their credentials in the IDP platform or in Active Directory. And across everything else, all of their access is immediately terminated. It doesn't matter if, we, if uh, you know, one of our L1 techs forgets to scope out or exclude them from a smart group because one of the parameters of the checklist is to deactivate their AD credentials. They deactivate their AD credentials. The PEM cert will download. It's not going to get them in anywhere, right? And then we can implement those GPOs, use Intune and Azure to provide the controls that we need for not just updates, but also providing the controls we need to maintain all of the security that we need in the Windows infrastructure, right? Uh, all the security that we may want inside of Linux, we can uh, go in and make sure that the right um, packages are there, right? In Mac OS, we can continue to Jamf Pro in the cloud version, but this time we actually know that's going to be reachable and we can go ahead and modify anything that we need to, right? We can control who has access, basically, everything quite easily through one interface if we wanted to, right? And we can also make changes live on our VMs. Because they're cloud hosted, it's not necessary just one user can log into one particular instance. All of us could log into that one instance and see things. We can assist users remotely. We can access the VMs, update software, install packages live on demand, modify the templates, all of it, 15 minutes at most, if we're working in Azure or AWS, right? We can even go ahead and modify the single sign-on links that we have 
for those users. So if we're embedding our Google, Google Cloud SSH access, or if we're embedding those Mac OS hyperlinks toward, to uh, the Apache uh, Guacamole server, right? We can modify those on demand and not have to worry about all of this stuff. And of course, let's not forget, everything's encrypted, right? We've got SSL encryption for all of our traffic, even internally to our data center. Granted, it takes a little bit of time. SSL is always preferred. And then we're encrypting the VMDK hard drive disks as well. So even if somebody decides to break into a massive data center, pull out that one hard drive, they're still not going to get anything done out of it. So what about scalability and licensing, right? Well, we just talked about it. We can go ahead and create those VMs within probably about, I think the longest I've seen is five minutes, and that's probably because it was a fluke in Azure and AWS for me, but I've been able to spin up VMs quite quickly and just go ahead and grab that information and put it into Jamf Pro in about another five, 10 minutes, right? And granted, we can automate the whole process too. We've chosen to have some sort of interaction with all the platforms to make sure things are done on a constant basis depending on things that we may need because we also have to watch our resources control, right? On top of which, we're able to get the licensing that we need uh, through Office, 65, uh, Office 365 subscription models, right? And we're able to use a bunch of PowerShell scripts and GPOs in our virtual environments to actually get all the other results that we need for, uh, for security, for mounting those file shares, for, for installing applications that need to be done on demand, right? So all of this has led up to a user experience that is very seamless, that users will be able to go ahead and do all of this stuff. And let's actually take a look at how this looks uh, in, on the user level itself. So, I think it's playing. This is our Mac OS. The user is going to go ahead and launch self-service, right? They're going to be prompted for their one login IDP credentials in self-service. They're going to authenticate themselves. Feel free, uh, feel free to capture that username. It's not going <laughs> to do anything. There was like 10 demo environments created for this. We're using two-factor authentication, so the user's gotten a request on their cell phone to go ahead and accept the push notification to get into self-service. It's going to load up their instance, and there they have all of the environments that they want. Notice it says bookmarks because you can open up bookmarks in self-service. The user go, went ahead and clicked on Google, because uh, Google's Ubuntu Linux instance that we have for them. They're going to authenticate Google IDP, as I want to show you guys. As soon as they do it, they're going to see a prompt for security, saying that, hey, we're going to embed an SSH session inside of your web browser. They're going to click Connect. And now they have an SSH session inside of self-service embedded inside of that web browser that they can do whatever they want to without, without having a need to open up terminal or anything else. And it's already logged them in because they've authenticated their identity. So now let's take a look at macOS, right? Well, uh, if anybody here is familiar with uh, Apache Guacamole, you can basically create a clientless experience in VNC, right, as macOS has for standard. And you can actually create a virtual environment that's going, that can actually be embedded inside of your web browser or in self-service, for that matter. So as soon as the user authenticates themselves with their IDP, depending on, again, your internet speed, and this was, what, 1042, so I was watching a bunch of stuff on Netflix at the same time, uh, you can go ahead and create that experience and have users in a virtual environment inside of self-service for macOS as well. And by the way, this will work with um, Windows, Ubuntu as well, you can basically do it for anything, depending on how you prefer it. Right? So let's get out of here. Let's take a look at what else we can access. Well, we can also go ahead and access our RDS environment, right? So we've got our smart group, they clicked on the button. Do they have Microsoft Remote Desktop? Not sure, so let's go ahead and push out Microsoft Remote Desktop as a VPP application, right? And go ahead and download that RDP certificate and load the environment for them. So all they have to do is authenticate again with their AD credentials to get into that environment to establish that, R, that RDBS, uh, RDS connection through the gateway. I, pr 
probably should have stopped watching that last episode of Luke Cage at that point, right? Um, and we're in our RDS environment now, right? And we can do whatever we want. As soon as we close out of this session, launch daemon kicks into action, deletes the certificate for RDP, and the user can't get back in unless they go into self-service, clicks connect again. Similarly, and obviously I'm showing you a bunch of different environments here, the process is identical for all of them, right? We are then able to go to our Ubuntu 10 development environment that we actually have in AWS, which is going to require a PEM security certificate. So that PEM cert is downloaded. This time we're actually going to launch it inside of Terminal. And the user has instant access without re-authenticating themselves inside of that Ubuntu environment at that point, right? And lastly, we can show you how we're doing a persistent virtual desktop in Azure with Windows 10 enterprise licensing, right? So all we've done is spun up our golden template in Azure, applied the user with the right subscription that we wanted it to, and the user is able to go ahead into their desktop environment in Azure, which is, again, which I love doing is being backed up. And all of these environments are there for various reasons, whether it's for intellectual property control, right, where you're, you're putting in medical data, you're putting in financial records, you're putting in a bunch of different things that you cannot afford to have sitting at, the, at, at that end point, at any point whatsoever. Cool. And that is our Windows 10 Enterprise environment. So let's go ahead and talk a little about what are the, some of the issues that we faced. What are some of the challenges that we, we're going to face with this, right? Well, as we all know, the biggest killer of all, all experiences is a slow internet connection, right? Uh, you can have that super fast internet connection wherever you need to, but your users are not going to be able to have that. They're, we've had users anywhere from on hotel Wi-Fi's to working off of a DS, DSL connection, right? Or they're out in the middle of, in the woods in Georgia at their cabin and they are working off of their satellite connection, right? So all of these things impact how our users can actually interact with the environment. And a lot of our users like to use two or three monitors. So you're going to be delivering a 1080p experience on three monitors over a DSL connection I, I recommend everybody try that because <laughs> it's bone crunching how long it takes to get one thing done. You're clicking on a button and you're sitting there and you're waiting, right? You're just waiting for a very long time for that button to react. And I'm looking at the server and the server is humming along with 32 gigs of RAM on that instance and so it works kicking away and, and the user is saying like, nothing's working for me, right? So what we've done to mitigate some of that was basically have these auto negotiations in the environments where traffic is communicated, the quality takes a little bit of a hit, or we decrease the amount of desktops that they need, but they still get the raw, the raw processing power of those virtual GPUs that we want to deliver, as well as the amount of resources that they need. The biggest thing that we've gotten user complaints about is the restrictive nature of things, right? Obviously, if a company says you can't plug in a USB drive, and you're coming to us saying, hey, I can't get my family photos off of my, you know, desktop and my virtual desktop. I'm like, that's right, you can't and you probably won't. Uh, you shouldn't have put it on there to begin with. And it's just basically that communication that surrounds these restrictions that we have to get users to accept. But only once they've started to actually get into this, this augmented workflow of having that security can their practices also change. One of the biggest challenges that we've also had is because of the back-end technology behind all of this. Because you're doing things at a really high level in some instances in Jav Pro with your policies, your smart groups, your extension attributes to get the right version controls, and et cetera. Um, and also the back-end technology in Azure, uh, AWS, and Google Cloud. Not everyone is able to get this done. How, by show of hands, how many persons here uh, work a lot in Azure, Google Cloud, or, or AWS, any of the cloud platforms to deliver services, right? So you have, you have these environments, and 
all of a sudden you have employee turnover on your IT team, and it becomes difficult to control you know, how you're able to deliver the same experience in a seamless way, which is why we've created automated steps. You, know, you click a button in self-service, actually, and it deploys out the next servers that you need in AWS or anything like that. But getting that comprehension is always a challenge to not just persons who are already technically competent, but also providing the training that's needed. And that's been, uh, that's been a concern for us as well. And obviously, one of the biggest factors when it comes down to all of this is hosting costs, right? How much of a virtual environment can you work in, work in your uh, flows? How much runtime can you afford in AWS or Azure? Or if you have your data center, perfect, right? Do you have caps on data, data traffic coming in or not? Uh, how much more bandwidth do you have to pay for at your data center? Right? How many more ESXi servers do you have to deploy with enough processing capabilities or the licenses needed for your uh, NVIDIA vGPUs? Right? All of that plays into a factor. And when you take a look at the scalability of that, though, uh, the fact that you are able to get that, you're able to get those resources, and then you take a look at that, it doesn't matter three years down the road, you're still going to have the same raw processing power even though the applications have upgraded because you have the central resources to deliver them, right? So is it actually worth it, right? Well, if we take a look at the amount of service tickets, we take a look at the ability to scale up really quickly, right? To deliver 50 desktops in a matter of hours, if necessary, right? Making sure quality is there not just in our ESX hypervisors in our data center, but in Azure, right? Uh, and we use Azure a lot, we use AWS a lot. Uh, getting that scalability is a huge thing right there because everyone likes it when you're able to get things done within 24 hours. Everyone loves it when they ask you for something on the phone and you have it up and running for them before the end of the phone call, right? Versus when we've had to get things done in parallel, VMware Fusion, create those templates. You're looking at like a three, four day process right there just to get every, all the kinks, in, uh, kinks uh, out of the whole, whole um, workflow in itself. This has, in a way, allowed us to decrease resource dependencies on the user side. Uh, we don't need to go running around to the CFOs telling them, hey, we need to get that new MacBook Pro, that, that new Mac Pro, because your users are using, uh, you know, the next version of uh, SolidWorks and they need that VM to actually deliver that experience. We don't need to do that anymore. We can give users a uh, MacBook Air. We can give users, a lot of users actually prefer to use iPads because they can get that virtual, virtual experience in their iPads as well using the keyboard. Right? And that's a huge game changer when you don't always have to ask for those new permissions. Um, it's increased, it's also decreased a lot of malware issues that we've seen where users are working inside of their VM, going to inappropriate sites or whatever sites with content, and then all of a sudden they give us a phone call a week later and then they have cryptocurrency malware on there, right? And all of a sudden everything's encrypted on their VMDK and, and we're gonna say basically, hey, you shouldn't have been there to begin with because now you can't get your files back. Right? Because we have those restrictive policies, those really awesome rules in place and GPOs to prevent those software applications. And if it's a non-persistent non -persistent virtual desktop, it's wiped clean so it doesn't even matter what they've installed. Right? And finally, the fact that we can have those redundant snapshots and backups of our environments uh, has been terrific, allowing us to maintain a minimum, a bare minimum of 30 data points a month. Right? On top of which, we're doing a constant backup inside of the environments for Mac OS and Windows uh, using Backblaze to just dump all of our stuff into the cloud, which you know, I'm sure they love because you're just dumping it there and not taking anything back, um, has been one of the most uh, awesome experiences we've been able to provide. Because now a user can come, can come back and I need that, po that uh, PowerPoint deck that I was working on inside of Windows uh, from last week. I'm like, yeah, not a problem. Give me a minute, and we go in and we get just that one file. And I promised that I would leave time for questions for you guys, so questions and answers. And I'm sure you guys have tons, if, as long as everybody's not hungover <laughs> from last night, obviously.
uh, we have Hi. Great presentation, thank you. Um, I guess my, my only question is about the Windows 10 licensing. How sure. does that work for, um, yeah, just a, a yeah. VM that if might you, only <laughs> exist for a small percentage of time? You'd be surprised at uh, the fact that there are so uh, private companies who specialize in just uh, navigating the waters of Windows licensing sometimes, right? And we deal with that too. So uh, we work a lot with Ingram and we're able to get the licensing models that we need. Uh, we're able to basically um, uh, either use uh, enterprise licensing in a, as Office 365 subscriptions, which does some of them include virtual desktops for Windows 10 in Azure, which is fantastic. But we actually also do Windows 10 enterprise licensing. And enterprise licensing is what you actually need when you want to deliver desktop infrastructure, virtual desktop infrastructure, locally in your data center or on your users' environments. Uh, granted, you have to go then into... Um, uh, cus uh, customer experience licensing, et cetera. And so is it um, the number of minutes that the VM is active? Oh, uh, hosting costs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it depends and it fluctuates, right? We, we've seen that um, costs based on the smallest tier instances that we spin up in Azure, for example, can vary from 50 bucks to 80 bucks, but it depends on the contracts that you have with Microsoft for discounted pricing for Azure as well. So have you looked to uh, utilize this for things like uh, remote resources? So instead of launching a full desktop, you're just launching a virtual application? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you're familiar with our RDS framework, right, and RDS Session House, uh, you're basically able to also single out a particular application and deliver it in the, using the RDS Session Host through the gateway. So you can absolutely, instead of providing a full infrastructure, if you really love that you know, Windows 10 calculator, you can go ahead and deliver that Windows 10 calculator or just Excel if you wanted to. I, I have a question at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a, um, a golden image, and um, how do you guys, or how does your company um, publish applications on the fly, say like, hey, I'm in this image and I, sure. you know. Sure, so, I mean, for like Microsoft, they use like AppV or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. so when I refer to a golden, golden image on a hypervisor for yeah. non-persistent virtual desktops, right? Uh, if we see that that application is not really necessary uh, for all of our users, uh, for the non-persistent desktops, we do have to go in and modify it. But if we see that on a constant basis, we'll just make it into a persistent desktop at that point and just install the application on the fly in oh, that uh, non-persistent desktop to make it persistent okay. as well. And one more question. Sure. Um, in terms of like personalization and things like that in a non-persistent image, I mean, how do you guys take care of that? Yes, yeah, so GPOs. Yes. Gotta, love those, gotta love those GPOs. You can customize every single experience, break it down to those particular users if you want to, okay. uh, and particular security groups if you have to as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Or use Intune to deliver it as well, which is good. Good? Uh, I'm sorry if you already touched on this, but do you do uh, Active Directory binding in... Um, in, in what instance? So for like Windows. Oh, so um, it depends, right? Uh, depends on the uh, depends on the needs. Depends on the clients as well, um, it, because you can also have Azure Active Directory as well in Windows environments. Uh, you can we can certainly do that um, in instances where we are using RDS. If they are in our data center, we do bind everything by default, right? When a new instance is spun up, the GPOs automatically kick into action for the right security group and the subnet they're in, and they will bind them as necessary. In Azure, we do do it because we do have site-to-site -site VPN to the Azure instance as well. So your own Active Directory? Yeah, uh, well, it depends. We have multiple Active Directory sessions. So, yeah, because, so we can bind different client groups and different domain forces as needed. So like, for example, we are a smaller company of a bigger company, and we need to bind our Windows VMs with the bigger companies. Oh, active okay. Directory. So you're using their larger domain forest at that point? Yes. Right. Yeah, you can absolutely do that as necessary, and depending on 
uh, how they've organized their forest and their GPO subsets, you can obviously just apply them uh, necessary to just your VD, adjust to the security group for your virtual machines as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Cool. Well, with that being said, folks, we're going to wrap up this session. Lunch is kicking off. A round of applause. Absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much. Good job.